So I usually begin this uh, talk um, when I give it by uh, giving the latest slide of a mass shooting. And depressingly, I've had to update this slide every single time I've given this talk. So this is, of course, the Florida shooting that occurred last, um, last week, 17 people killed. That comes hot in the heels of the Las Vegas shooting in, in uh, last October that killed 59, the deadliest mass shooting in America. And a month after that, the Texas shooting that killed 26. So we've had three of the deadliest shootings in the U US happen in the past five months. If it seems like there's more and more mass shootings these days, you're right. Every year, the number of mass shootings goes up. So violence is a problem. I'm a forensic psychiatrist with a background in neuroscience, and I spend a lot of time thinking about these questions, which we'll be exploring in the talk. Why do people commit violence? How can we reduce violence? And can neuroscience help? So when we look at the world of repeat violent offenders and look underneath the hood, we see basically three different groups. Those with mental illness, a group of people we call antisocial, and within that group of antisocials, a hardcore group of antisocials that we call psychopaths. One way to differentiate these groups is that generally people with severe mental illness commit violent uh, acts uh, for irrational reasons, whereas those who are antisocial and psychopaths typically commit violent um, acts due to rational reasons. Now, every, after every mass shooting, there there's typically some sort of scapegoating of the mentally ill, and that's happened this time as well. And I want to explain to you why I think that's so misguided. So the severely mentally ill comprise 4% of the adult uh, population, but they only commit 3% of overall violence. So in other words, the people with severe mental illness are actually less violent than the average person. And when you look at mass shootings, less than 1% of mass shootings um, have to do with someone with a severe mental illness. To contrast that, the group of psychopaths, um, so psycho psychopaths comprise 1% of the adult uh, population. They comprise 20% of the prison population. And because they recidivate so frequently, it's thought that they're responsible for over half of all violent crimes. This is a group of people worth studying and worth trying to cure if possible. So psychopaths are labeled cold-blooded killers. And there's a group of qualities that, uh, that unites them. So typically, psychopaths are emotionally detached. They're said to lack empathy. They lack remorse. Uh, so after committing horrible acts that we would feel very guilty about, they feel no guilt at all. They have low levels of anxiety and fear. And the type of violence they inflict typically is planned aggression as opposed to reactive, impulsive aggression. And very curiously, mo many, if not most, come from intact backgrounds. And if you're like me, you're like, really? They come from intact backgrounds? Yeah, really, most of them come from intact backgrounds. And this is strong evidence that psychopathy is a genetic condition as opposed to something that was created by a bad environment. If we look at the evidence uh, for the biological basis of psychopathy, it's strong. So again, there's no detectable differences in family backgrounds between psychopaths and non-psychopaths. We also know from twin studies that it's strongly heritable. And the traits are apparent from early childhood, and you can also see brain differences from a very early age. All of this adds up to the, fact, to, the, to, the, um, to the conclusion that psychopathy is essentially a genetic condition. And the idea is that bad genes lead to brain abnormalities, and those brain abnormalities can help explain deviant behaviors. So psychopaths are said to lack conscience. And actually, the study of psychopathy has been a tremendous boon to neuroscience. By studying the brains of psychopaths, neuroscientists have come to a much better idea of what the conscience is, and most remar remarkably, what parts of the brain are required to have conscience. So I want to introduce you to a, um, a, a brain area called the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, or the VMPFC, which is a key brain area necessary to have a conscience. So the ventromedial uh, prefrontal cortex sits in between the middle halves of, um, of both hemispheres. And it's a key area for emotional intelligence. And it participates in three activities that I would argue generates our conscience. The first is, it creates, um, it, so it creates emotional memories, which form the basis of social inhibitions. The second is, it, it is essential brain area for imagination, and you need imagination to have empathy. The third uh, characteristic is it it's, uh, plays a major role in impulse control, which we need to, have to make wise decisions. These three qualities, to, be, to have social inhibitions, to have empathy, and to have impulse control, I would argue, constitute the core of what we mean by having a conscience. And psychopaths have defective ventromedial prefrontal cortexes. So that means they don't do these things, they don't have a conscience, and you're more likely to end up like this guy. <laughs> so let's take these one at a time. So emotional memories. 
So <laughs> I have a toddler named Kyle, and anyone who's raised a toddler knows that toddlers can be little savages. They fight, they kick, they scream, and over time we civilize them. How do we civilize them? It's all about <laughs> negative feedback, right? So every time you did something bad, like hit your brother, your mom said, don't do that. It made you feel kind of bad in your body. This is the part of the brain that stores that emotional linkage so that the next time you contemplate hitting little Billy, it replays that emotion so you feel bad in your body, and hopefully that guides you away from, from doing that violent act. And over time, this forms our, the basis of our social inhibitions against doing violent acts. The next part is uh, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex plays an essential role in what I call the imagination engine, which, which is essential to have empathy. So what do we mean by empathy? Empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. It's the foundation for pro-social behavior, and there's an obvious evolutionary benefit. If we act pro-socially you know, to others, it means we can live in large groups, and those large groups help protect from predators and help us get resources. And the key thing about empathy is that it requires imagination. It requires that you put yourself in the shoes of another person. Now, Having an imagination is one of the coolest things your brain pulls off. So when you think about it, you can close your eyes and think back to a really significant day in your life. Maybe it's the day you got married. Maybe it's the day you got divorced. <laughs> Maybe it's the day that your, that your firstborn child was born. The thing is, you can close your eyes and replay those events with sounds and visuals and thoughts and feelings. You can literally re-feel the feelings that you had with that event. We can do the same thing with imagining things in the future, with imagining various hypotheticals, asking your boss for a raise. And when you think about asking your boss for a raise, your imagination engine kicks into gear, and you can literally feel your heart starting to pound faster, right? So it's a really cool trick. Uh, and the brain accomplishes this with the imagination engine, which is a series of interconnected brain, area, brain areas that work in concert to create virtual simulations. Simulations so it can replay past events, it can, re it can recreate it can create future events, it can create hypotheticals. It can also create uh, you know, it, uh, models of other people, so we can guess what other people are thinking and feeling. Now, the really cool thing is different parts of the imagination engine compute different parts of this simulation. So one important part is the hippocampus, which is an important area for memory. These memories feed the imagination engine with past experiences for which, with, with which it can create new experiences. The dorsal medial prefrontal cortex is an essential area to, that helps us figure out what other people might be thinking. So it gives us cognitive understanding. The ventral medial prefrontal cortex helps us imagine what other people might be feeling. Not only do we know what other people might be feeling, this area helps us to feel what they might be feeling. Right. Now the thing with psychopaths is that their dorsal medial prefrontal cortex is intact, so they can perfectly well imagine you know, what, what you might be thinking. Right? So that allows them to lie and manipulate really well but they have defects in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, so they have trouble feeling what other people are feeling. In other words, they have impaired empathy. And if you have impaired empathy and you can't feel what other people are feeling, essentially other people are objects, and we treat objects really differently than people, right? Throwing out a hard drive, that's no big deal, right? So a famous psychopathy researcher put it this way, psychopaths know the words, but not the music. All right, let's go to the last function that I want to talk about with the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, its role in impulse control. So I'm going to introduce you to two areas of the brain you might have heard of already. One is the amygdala, the other one is the nucleus accumbens. Now, the amygdala is our monster detector. These are ancient, both of these are ancient parts of the brain that constantly scan the environment for things that help you survive. The amygdala is our monster detector. So it's on the, it's on the lookout for things that might, be, might constitute threats to you. And when it finds something that might be a threat to you, it generates an emotion that makes you want to, want to move away from that object, emotions like fear. Your nucleus accumbens is your donut detector. So it's constantly looking out on for things that are pleasurable to you. And when it finds it, finds those things, it generates an emotion that makes you want to approach those things, right? Things like attraction or craving. Now, um, the thing is, you know, we don't always run away from everything that's scary. We don't run to every donut that we come across. Well, most of us don't, right? <laughs> Why is that? And the reason why is because the amygdala and the nucleus accumbens are not decision-making areas of the brain. They feed information to other brain areas which do make decisions, brain areas like the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. So the ventral medial prefrontal cortex is like a wise teacher that sits in your brain and receives information up from these impulses about the scary monsters and the donuts and says, well, okay, I, got, I, I hear you, amygdala, I hear you, nucleus accumbens, but I'm not so sure we should act on those impulses. It consults other areas of the brain to give it access to past experiences and to reasons. So it's able to compute an integrated decision based on 
experiences, reasons, and the impulses to make wise decisions. Now, in contrast, so if, you're, <laughs> so if you look at the psychopathic brain, there are several brain differences. One is their amygdala is less active and smaller. So uh, they truly are less fearful of things in general. Their nucleus accumbens, on the other hand, is overactive. So donuts look super tasty to them. They should, definitely shouldn't move to Portland. Um, and like as I said before, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex doesn't function so hot. So instead of having this wise guru in your brain, you have something like this guy, right? And so um, you know, you're less able to compute these integrated wise decisions, and you're more a slave of your impulses. So when you talk about a psychopathic brain, this is a brain that is not set up for fear and super set up for immediate gratification. That makes you an impulsive person. So moving on to the last part of the talks, can, psych can psychopathy be cured? Well, yes, in theory. So if we know the biological causes of psychopathy, we should be able to design rational biological solutions to psychopathy. And we should be able to come up with, uh, with therapies at each of these levels, at the gene, at the brain, and with behavior. So let's take these one at a time. So most of you have probably heard of gene therapy. Modern medicine is getting better and better. It's snipping out bad sections of, of, of genes and putting in good genes. And in fact, two months ago, the FDA approved the very first gene therapy treatment in, in the US. Uh, but the problem with psychopathy is that we don't yet know, we know that it's a genetic condition, but we don't yet know what those genes are. And we know from indirect evidence that there are many genes that are involved. So to get to the point where we can identify all those genes and then fix all those genes simultaneously, it's going to require a lot of technical advancements. So gene therapy would, will be a cure one day, but that day is quite far off. What about at the level of the brain? Can we change brain activity in a way to make psychopaths more empathetic? We live in a golden age of neuroscience, and there are so many modalities I would love to tell you about that we can now use to influence brain activity. One of the most promising is on the right here. It's called transcranial magnetic stimulation. You basically put a magnetic coil on, on top of the head, and it, uh, it, uh, it generates magnetic pulses that can, gener that can pass through the skull and, uh, and either stimulate or inhibit the brain underneath it. So this is a way we can safely and reversibly either increase the activity of brain areas or decrease the activity of brain areas. And there have been lots of studies that show that if you do the TMS at just the right spots in the brain, you can actually increase empathy. Now, you know, there are many technical barriers until this, you know, this technology can be perfected, but really I think that the main barrier is not technical, but it's a social barrier. So when I look at technologies like implanting electrodes in your brain or you know, pulsing your brain in magnetic waves, I think that's super cool. But many of you might think more like this, you know, like, yuck, that's a little, that's a little creepy. You know, the mind's a sacred space, and we don't like the idea of people messing with our minds, especially if it's against our will, like we would have to do a psychopath, right? So I think the main barriers here to really fully implementing brain technologies to cure psychopathy are societal barriers. Well, what about behaviors? Can we change psychopathic behaviors? And so there's been lots of studies on empathy training. So I, you know, I've argued through the, brain, the genes in the brain that empathy is an inborn ability, but it's also a skill, and skills improve with practice. There are literally dozens of uh, programs that have been validated and shown to increase empathy if you actually apply them. You know, the problem is practice requires motivation, and when you think about it, why would psychopaths want to be more empathetic? You know, for, for, from the point of view of a psychopath, you know, we're all suckers waiting to be conned, right? And for a lot of psychopaths, they might think that the lack of empathy is an advantage, right? They're not like encumbered by morality, right? So then the question becomes, how do we create a world where psychopaths make pro-social choices? See, the idea is that biology is not destiny. I've argued that psychopaths are biologically different. They have less empathy, for instance. But just, just the mere fact that you have less empathy than average doesn't make you automatically make you a serial murderer, right? So you know, let's, let's say you have a baby, and this happens to be my baby, baby Dean, um, who is not a psychopath. But <laughs> let's say there is a baby that has low levels of empathy. It doesn't automatically follow that they become a serial murderer, right? Maybe they, should, they can become a surgeon, right? There's lots of studies that show that surgeons, on average, are less empathetic than the average person. And that might be a good thing, right? Because if you're doing surgery, right, you kind of want to be able to shut off your emotions and focus on the super complicated cognitive task at hand, right? So the question becomes, how do we nudge this baby away from being a serial murderer and to become a surgeon? I think the key is to realize that although psychopaths have defects with their emotions, that they are rational. And some would say they are hyper-rational because they're not like encumbered or you know, they're not like encumbered by emotions. Um, and they can play by the rules beautifully when it suits them. And so we can view a lot of their criminal behavior as actually selfish but rational choices to get the things that they want, resources, respect, power, whatever it is. 
the idea is that, is that if we can create and offer rational altruistic alternatives, maybe they'll do that instead of crime, right? So how do we create a world where altruism is a way to get ahead? I believe there are three conditions we have to meet. Basic needs have to be met, the rules have to be fair, and the culture has to support cooperation. So Abraham Maslow studied what, you know, what humans need to, to survive and thrive, and this is the famous pyramid of needs, right? And so the lowest level of needs are physiological needs like food and, and water. The next level are safety needs. And it's only when those needs are met can you start to think about societal needs, right? So if you live below this line, Right, sort of like you're living in a war zone where the resources are scarce and it's like it's a zero-sum game. The more you have, the less I have, right? So altruistic and selfish interests do not align in that kind of world. It's only when these basic needs are met that we can have the possibility that selfish and altruistic um, acts can, and, can coincide. But the rules have to be fair and the culture has to be supportive. So the bottom line is we are all responsible. I've said that psychopaths are the 1% of the population that's responsible for 50% of all violent uh, acts. But ending violence isn't just about fixing psychopaths. We also need to fix the world around them, and this is what our responsibility, responsibility is. This is what we need to do, everyone in this room needs to do, if we want to reduce violence. We have to make sure that there's universal access to basic needs, things like food, safety, and shelter. It's only after those basic needs are met that, that there's a potential to think altruistically. Once those needs are met, we still need to work on creating a fair world. You know, most of you in this room who are not criminals uh, you know, had lots of opportunities, right? To not, lots of non-criminal alternatives uh, to get the things that you want, to have a good job and, and resources and stuff like that. So we need to make sure that those opportunities are available to everyone so we can give potential psychopaths non-criminal alternatives. We also have to work on creating a kind world, uh, a world where, where, you know, it's in, where kindness is, is, reward, is recognized and rewarded and encouraged. I'm thinking about the, think about the worst workplace you ever worked at, like some corporate law firm or whatever. <laughs> think about the best workplace you ever worked at. Those cultures are super different because they value different things. If we create a world that values kindness, we'll have more kind people in it. So if we do these three things, give universal access to basic needs, create a fair world and create a kind world, we're essentially creating a world where the rational and the selfish choice is the altruistic choice, and we'll sh we should have more surgeons and fewer murderers. I, leave, I let, leave you with the words of the Dalai Lama. My religion is very simple. My religion is kindness. Thank you.